All right, folks, and welcome back once again to English 403, 503, Digital Rhetoric, uh, Discourse and Culture with me, Dr. Matt Barton. Uh, and in this lecture, we'll be wrapping up our discussion of Doug Iman's book on digital rhetoric. And this is, I don't know about you, but I thought this was one of the more interesting chapters because here he's really getting into specifics and giving some really fun examples uh, of what he's talking about. And it's things that kind of, frankly, are inspiring uh, things that you might want to do one day, maybe as part of a culminating project, or if you're if you're interested in teaching, you know, there's a lot here as well that you might do with a class. Uh, so lots of good meat here in this chapter, if you will. Uh, so we're going to be talking about uh, digital rhetoric as far as uh, pedagogy, which means teaching. And you know, by the way, just a, a side note here. <laughs> uh, there's another word that's andragogy. And so the pedagogy means teaching kids, basically. And andragogy is about adult learning. Uh, and I never knew that until the other day. Uh, so I was listening to a course about the brain and learning. <laughs> so anyway, just a little aside note. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny to me that people talk about pedagogy in the context of college teaching. It seemed like it should be that other word, andragogy. But anyway, uh, we'll be talking about that, uh, basically how to teach with this stuff. Uh, talk about some uh, scholarship that people in the community do. Uh, Doug Iman, he's the editor of Kairos, so he talks a lot about that. It's kind of the flagship journal, really, uh, for more in digital work. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but there's also computers and composition journals. There's kind of a lot of conferences where you can go and present about this stuff, including one here in Minnesota. Uh, let me get the name of that for you. Yeah, here it is. This is the... GPAC W, I don't know how you pronounce that. It's Great Plans Alliance for Computers and Writing. And this is one from last year, or when you're watching this, maybe several years ago. But uh, I'll see if I can get the more uh, up to date info. It might not be out yet. But that's a, a conference that's always uh, either here in, sometimes it's in the Twin Cities, sometimes it's in North Dakota, sometimes it's in uh, South Dakota, but it's always somewhere around the area. Uh, but we'll come back to that when we get to that section. And then we will talk. At, about some of the examples of what he calls digital rhetoric in action, uh, which to me is the really cool bit of this. It's, you know, not just writing about digital media using print, you know, basically, uh, but actually using the tools to discuss it and analyze it, if, if you will. So it's kind of a, a pretty cool, you know, it, it, it kind of makes sense <laughs> uh, to be talking about that in this context. And, uh, plus, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, let's see. So he starts off here talking about classical rhetoric, uh, you know, having to do with teaching and, you know, sort of however far back you go with uh, rhetoric. Uh, it starts off as a teaching method, right? And it's it's the, sort of the thing that you learn. <laughs> you know, it's the, it's the uh, part of the trivium, the original three things, uh, three subjects you might learn in school. Uh, one of those was rhetoric. Uh, the other was grammar and logic. And rhetoric was considered the more advanced, you know, this is basically high school, I suppose, <laughs> when you graduate to the rhetoric classes. Um, but, you know, even further back, if you go to the sophist, you know, we talked a little bit about, he talks in here about Protagoras. Of course, there's Gorgias, and Plato has a lot of dialogues. These are basically teachers. You know, these are the first paid teachers. I think about them as kind of like these self-help gurus we have nowadays. You know, people pay a lot of money to, you know, teach me the three secrets of success, you know, or whatever the case may be. Now, that's basically what these sophists were like. You know, they were offering classes and workshops, you know, to use some modern language uh, for that. And, of course, part of that was uh, not just, you know, how to speak correctly and, you know, what are the grammar rules and so on. You know, that, that was already, <laughs> that's kind of basic stuff. All right, this was part of uh, how do you be persuasive? How do you be a good leader uh, in society? How do you win arguments? Because remember, you know, no, no lawyers and attorneys to argue the case for you. You have to get up there and argue, argue your own case. Uh, and part and parcel with that, interestingly enough, um, was the idea that you had to be a good person. Uh, so there's a strong moral element uh, to going to school and learning from a sophist. You know, the last thing you'd want to be, you know, they, they would uh, hate the idea that they were teaching you how to bamboozle people or how to be a good swindler. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that obviously, uh, you know, that would make people suspicious of the sophists, right? Uh, so the idea instead was, we want people of good moral character. And the, you might think, what does that have to do with being persuasive? Well, if you think about it for a minute, if people think you're a good person, 
they're more likely to believe you. And even if they think you're wrong, at least you're coming from a good place. Uh, so they'll still treat you with more respect and be more likely to listen to you uh, than the reverse. Uh, so that's kind of a, a little bit about the background of this. And uh, also Aristotle talks about using all available means of persuasion. Uh, so one way, and we, we've sort of talked about this already, is that, you know, you just take those classical canons and you just adapt them and you think about computers or wikis or blogs or, tw or Twitter or whatever the case may be, <laughs> TikTok, and you think, well, this is just another means of uh, persuasion here, right? It's, it's something new. Uh, but rhetoric isn't concerned with just one thing like speech or with writing. You know, you could, you could apply these principles to anything because you know, really it's pretty broad general uh, categories. Uh, so that, that's definitely one approach. Uh, but anyway, I could talk more about that, but I think that's the gist of this. Uh, then he gets into some of the examples. He's got Sarah Arroyo, Seminar on Digital Rhetoric, and I think he's got Byron Hawk in here. Uh, and I think there's one other one, right? Who does he talk about last? His, his own work. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, again, I'm not going to go through each one of these. You can, you can read them on your own. Uh, i just say in my experience, I've tried to work similarly to Arroyo, uh, probably more like Hawk, I suppose. I, I did try to use this Ning platform. Of first few times I taught this course, I used that. Uh, and the thing, I don't even know if it's around anymore. Matter of fact, let's just see if it's still even available. Yeah, it looks like it's available. I don't remember what the deal was. You know, I'd used this for a while, and then I think they started requiring a fee or something to use it. Uh, but it was basically like uh, all the social media in one place. Uh, so instead of having to create a blog and then create a Twitter feed and then go over here and, you know, do all you know three or four different things, uh, everything was just self-contained on that platform, that one software program. And it was nice for me as a teacher because then I could easily just click and see, oh, look, here's Tim or here's Julie or, you know, <laughs> and I click click on Julie's uh, uh, file and get everything that she'd worked on and I could, you know, easily grade that. So it's it kind of useful in that sense. But uh, I don't remember what the deal was if it got, you yeah, know, built in integration with all the stuff. Uh, seems like it started requiring a user fee. You know, I might want to revisit that. It says monetization, yeah, pricing. Let's just see. Yeah, so it looks like they have, uh, yeah, so the basic, you, you can try it for free. <laughs> That's how they get you. <laughs> but then they're like, uh oh, 25 bucks a month. You know, I guess that's not that bad, but, you know, students just didn't want to pay that. And, you know, there's all kinds of free alternatives, but but this does kind of get at, I think, one of the problems that he talks about in this chapter. You know, the teachers like me, anyway, and, you know, I'm certainly not the only one. Uh, we know, like, this is the future. You know, the students are going to be needing to use uh, these the social media. They need to know how to do a blog, uh, and they need to do more advanced stuff than that, frankly. Uh, but we just don't necessarily have the resources here on campus you know you can only do so much with d12 <laughs> it's not like d12 has everything uh, that you need there uh, but the problem is if you start trying to have students work on these you know especially in the context of say uh, an english 191 class for example i think there's a fairly legitimate argument that uh you know what are you doing this is supposed to be a writing class why are you spending all this time learning uh, something like Ning or having them do uh, a blog you know, the, I think the blog, you make a pretty good case that it's kind of basically, it's basically an essay online, right? <laughs> uh, but some of the other stuff, like the comics, uh, I know people that have done uh, mashup videos and things, um, you know, instead of the traditional essay. Uh, so you kind of get into these issues of whether or not you're really achieving the student learning outcomes that are advertised on the <laughs> course description. Uh, but, you know, certainly you could have other classes besides just a 191 where you might want to develop some of these. Uh, let's look here at uh, Iman's class. So he doesn't have an English or freshman comp class. He is teaching a class called Web Authoring and Design. Provides a rhetorical foundation for web authoring and design in professional settings. Go away. <laughs> uh, students will learn basic principles of writing for the web. So I guess that's where the sort of traditional Englishy stuff comes in. Uh, but then he's got information architecture, some coding, some programming, basically, some scripting, usability testing, 
Uh, so there's a, a little bit of what might be taught in a computer literacy class or even a computer programming class. I don't know how advanced he gets with this. Looks like he's doing a, some XHTML, CSS. Uh, that's something I've kind of gone back and forth with in, in my classes. I remember when we did the wiki book, I did a wiki book in this class many years ago, uh, which is a, actually gets mentioned sometimes. It's kind of fun to see a St. Cloud State professor, you know, Matt Barton in this class doing this wiki book. Uh, but the problem with it was even, uh, you know, the students had to learn a little bit of coding or scripting even to use that wiki. Uh, there's certain tags they had to put in when they wanted to do, say, a table of contents or to make a link to one part of the wiki to another part of the wiki. There was some uh, tagging, they called that, and some, I think they called it wiki markup language. Uh, and even that, you know, I remember having classes where we get kind of into the weeds on that. You know, how do I do this? It's not working. Uh, you know, we might spend a whole class period just working with that scripting stuff. And, you know, it really was kind of little to do <laughs> uh, with rhetoric and writing uh, at that point, right? Just trying to struggle with a computer to make, to make it work. <laughs> you know, the same thing with this CSS. It's, it's you know, it's it's cool, but I don't... I'm kind of torn myself on whether it's something I want to be teaching, you know, in a class like this. You know, I think it's important to know, but, you know, the right place, the right time, I, I would say. You know, basically, there's people that could teach that stuff a lot better than, <laughs> than, than I can. I'm just kind of a dabbler in it. Uh, what else has he got in uh, Does he have in here? I think that's probably about... The gist of that. Let's see. Oh, here's where he's tie. Here's where he ties it into classical rhetoric. So he talks about these planes to the considerations of classical rhetoric, where their strategy plane connects to audience, user needs, purpose, product, objectives. The scope plane is maps to invention, structure, and skeleton plane. Oh, that's what he's talking about here. So like the skeleton plane, he calls it. The interface design, navigation design, and information design. See, so like the layouts of menus and uh, you know how you navigate the app, I suppose, or the website. And he says that's kind of like that arrangement canon uh, of classical rhetoric. You know, when when that they talked about the introduction, the conclusion, the order of uh, precedence. You know, how do you, what facts do you put first? You know, how do you, what should you emphasize, and so on and so forth. That was the arrangement. So that kind of makes sense, and it really goes to show you, you know, how this classical stuff is still very relevant. You know, I'm, I'm constantly coming across uh, books and things, and they'll be like, the brand new, uh, a brand new way to look at web design, <laughs> or, or the most effective blogging techniques, and or you look at something from the world of uh, marketing. And, you know, it's basically the same stuff. It's just this ancient rhetoric stuff, but they've, they're using different names for it. You know, they might be talking about a product objective, instead of a, a purpose, you know, they might rename it, but you, know, you kind of wonder, are they just reinventing the wheel with this stuff? You know, if you're talking about the same concepts, you might as well use the uh, people like Aristotle and uh, uh, Gorgias, for that example, or uh, Quintilian, Cicero. I mean, this, they've already <laughs> you know, arguably said the best stuff you're ever going to say about uh, rhetoric, in those days, so the real key is just what can we repurpose and how can we adapt. Uh, then he goes into um, uh, the scholarship of digital rhetoric. And I think this is where he is talking about the, um, yeah, some of the books, I guess, things that have come before the uh, these folks that have tried to prepare. Um, uh, what's the word for that? I, I'm thinking about annotated bibliography, but I don't think that's the right term. Uh, but they, they look at all the stuff that's been written and they try to summarize, you know, basically where, where we've been, where, we're, where we are, where we're going. Uh, they talked in here, or he talked, uh, Iman talks in here about Sherry Turkle's book. Uh, she's, I think we have a, something by her on the uh, syllabus. But she's really well known for this book, Life on the Screen. Uh, there's another one, I don't know if it gets mentioned in here, Brenda Laurel has a book called uh, Computers as Theater, a couple about human computer uh, interface design, and let's see, Taylor Ward's Literacy Theory in the Age of the Internet, you know, Howard Rheingold does a lot of work, we used to use his book in this class, he's, he talks a lot about something he calls 
the smart mobs. <laughs> That's, it's almost like a social look at some of these online communities and the things they're doing. Uh, let's see what else we have. Uh, yeah, Computers and Composition, I've published in that journal. Uh, New Media and Society, not familiar with that one. He says it's a print journal of internet research studies. And then he gives some examples. Of, let's see, Christian Penzold studies how Wikipedia authors understand and articulate community by examining online discussions among editors and applying a grounded theory approach to the analysis. Now, so that sounds like pretty good, a pretty good research topic. It's a little bit broad. You know, you might want to, if, if a student came to me and said, this is what I want to do for my culminating project, I want to do a thesis on this or something like that, uh, I'd probably say, let's, instead of talking about Wikipedia in general, you know, maybe focus in on one <laughs> subgroup of Wikipedia, you know, some of the uh, editors of a certain page, maybe, or a certain topic, you know, see what you could pick up on, on there. Uh, but that's certainly legitimate. Yeah, ethos action. I remember looking into this topic one time about uh, Wikipedia and ethos or uh, credibility. You know, basically, with Wikipedia, uh, the idea is anybody can edit a page, right? So I could, if there's a page here about penciled, Christian pencil, then I could just log into Wikipedia and edit that page and add some details or, or change some stuff around, basically. But what people don't know or people don't think about is just because I make those changes doesn't mean they're going to stick, right? Somebody might quickly come around and change it back to the way it were. That's called revert it back to the um, version before I started tampering with it. Uh, or, you know, they might say, this is, you know, pretty good changes. Um, you know, let's just leave it. You know, these are, uh, we'll approve basically these changes. It's almost like a peer review process, really. And so I, I, I was looking into that and I figured that um, I was interested in how Wiki, Wikipedia attracted people to do that. You know, how do they reward people for uh, making good changes and getting stuff approved? And it turned to find, you know, I don't, it's been a few years, but you know, at the time they had these um, badges uh, that you could earn. I think it was one called the Barn Star Badge. Kind of like a, you know, a lot of uh, multiplayer games do this sort of thing. <laughs> Same sort of thing with achievements. <laughs> uh, but you could basically be awarded these merit badges. And then you could put those onto your profile. You had a profile within Wikipedia. And it was a way to sort of say, look, you know, here's who I am. I've got this, uh, these awards. I've been recognized for my excellence uh, from the Wikipedia community. And then that was all about saying that, uh, you know, when I go in and make some changes, it's probably pretty good changes, right? Because, you know, again, look at, look at my profile, <laughs> see these badges. <laughs> yeah, that, that's kind of the way that it worked. And so it was no longer just an anonymous thing where just random people were coming in and editing a page. You know, this was uh, very... People worked hard to construct their online profile and show that, hey, I know what I'm talking about. You know, I'm a good person. <laughs> Look, I've been recognized. And so that's, you know, these are things you could study and write about and publish in these journals. Uh, here's one about, uh, let's see, a question of community from a new media composition perspective rooted in the rhetorical understandings of community and identity. And what are they looking at specifically Creating a video that profiles a lo local neighborhood center, a digital installation on the history of the Cherokee Nation, and a digital project focused on the preservation and practice of Indian classical dance amid its remediation via new media technologies. That sounds really cool. Okay, so the you know this idea of remediation. I don't know if we talked about that before. Uh, that comes uh, from a book by Bolter. I believe it's uh, J. Bolter and Grusin. Let me just see if I can find that. Bolter and Grusin. Yeah, there it is. It's kind of dated nowadays. Uh, but what this book was about, you know, is how people take, uh, oh, things like television shows, for example, from the 80s, and they kind of uh, do things to them to make them relevant for online viewing. So it's kind of like you're watching the show on say, uh, Amazon Prime, instead of watching it be broadcast on, on cable or, or whatever. And plus they add some new bells and whistles to it, you know, to sort of remediate it. It's so kind of retrieving stuff from the past. And 
Uh, Marshall McLuhan also talks about that sort of thing. Uh, and also, he, he we'll get into in a minute here about the, the mashups and the, you know, adding, uh, taking old stuff and putting it into new, uh, new media projects, if you will, or digital media. Uh, so lots of stuff there. The boundary between the definition of community identity and the possibility of connection to both internal and external audiences. Uh, let's see, what else is here? Eternally, analyzing media specifically within the context of composition studies, technological, social, economic, archival, aesthetics, objective, epistemo epistemological, which are particularly relevant to media's functions as cultural formations as <laughs> a rhetorical praxis. <laughs> now that is, uh, yeah, what they're talking about here, let's see, who is this, Turnley? Melinda Turnley, I believe, yeah, rubric for the assessment of digital, ah, Kindle's going crazy. And go back. Uh, so the idea with, behind this is something that'd probably be more interesting to you if you were wanted to teach this stuff. Uh, but one of the things that always comes up is, you know, we, we have enough trouble just trying to assess a five paragraph essay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you put two or three English teachers together into a room and say, look, grade the same essay. Uh, you know, just, just, you know, look at it and give us a grade and you know, tell us what you think, you know, A, B, C, D, whatever. And they find a lot of times that even these teachers that have been doing this for 20, 30, sometimes even, <laughs> I don't know, 50 years, let's say, uh, yet they're giving all kinds of different grades. You know, maybe one of them gives it an A, one of them a C. It's just kind of all over the place. And, well, you know, students will often complain Look, you know, I got a, this one professor. I was making A's on my writing. Now I got this other professor, and they're now I'm making C's. And you know, well, what's what's going on? Uh, so the educational folks, you know, looked at the situation basically. They said, we, we need we need some kind of standards, some some rubrics. So then instead of just saying A or B, you know, we go in and have a criteria basically, yeah, and then you figure out how much how to weigh those criteria. So, you know, my classes, I'll typically have focus, development, style, organization, and conventions, which are pretty close to those rhetorical canons, if you think about it. Uh, but then you might flesh those out a little bit. Uh, so you might say, if you get a two in organization, uh, that means that the introduction was uh, non-existent or the conclusion wasn't right or, <laughs> you know, you get the idea. But you basically got a little bit more detail about why you got one score as opposed to another, right? And then the students tend to be happier with this. <laughs> Instead of just a letter grade, uh, they get a little bit of insight into, uh, you know, how they were assessed for that. Uh, and then, of course, you can do the same thing to a whole program, try to figure out, are, are the students in St. Cloud State, are they, are they learning how to be better writers? You know, let's uh, apply these rubrics to some artifacts or essays and so on and so forth. But, okay. Uh, the question is, is somebody that's teaching a first-year composition class and is trained in composition and to teach essays, uh, does that necessarily mean that they'll be able to properly assess or evaluate, say, a flash video or a, a YouTube video or, or an audio podcast or, or a tweets? You know, these are you know, our Facebook, you know, arguably very different uh, contexts. You know, are these the best folks to be evaluating these things? You know, sometimes I get into this. Uh, you know, when I, when I was teaching, say, flash animations or uh, even really PowerPoint or websites, you know, some students will spend a lot of time working on the design of the website and you know, making it look really nice, you know, really choosing the best possible fonts and so on and so forth. They're really lovely photos and images in there. Uh, but you could say... You know, somebody could point at me and say, what do I know about that? You know, I'm not a photographer. You know, I'm not some kind of artist. I'm not a graphical graphics designer. You know, I'm very far removed from that in my training. You know, so how do we assess this? And really, can any one person assess it? You know, even if I was a graphic designer, uh, then the question would be, do I have the writing? Uh, you know, the composition skills to be able to evaluate the written component. So it can get really tricky you know, try to juggle all that. So that's why there's a lot of uh, publications about, you know, how do you assess these things? Um, you know, should you even have these in the class? 
you know, English 191 class, maybe you should just stick to writing. Uh, you know, where do you draw the line there? Uh, and then he gets into what I think is probably the best part of this chapter, the scholarship. Well, actually, I like the, uh, the the part right after this. But Okay, so all this stuff we've been talking about so far have been written. Uh, essays about digital media in the classroom and beyond. Uh, but you can also use digital rhetoric itself. Uh, or instead of just writing an essay in Word and, and saving it as a doc or a PDF and you know, uploading it to, to Kairos, um, uh, Iman and Cheryl Ball here and all the other folks involved in, in Kairos, they say, you know, this is a, it's on a computer. You know, why are we just recreating, excuse me, you know, why are we just doing the same old stuff we could do in a print journal, uh, even though we have this, you know, this is uploaded, it's online, it's, you know, we, we could be doing a lot more cool stuff <laughs> instead of just, you know, the standard text. Uh, why don't we, uh, you know, uh, they, they really like, I guess, you know, instead of just submitting a standard article, journal article, uh, if instead you're doing things with media, you know, video clips or fun little things with uh, navigation where you're, you're clicking around. I'll show you some of those in, some of those in a second. Uh, or, you know, learn some programming and then have a, you know, something more interactive. You know, it, it does make a certain amount of sense. And the example that I like to go to for this, I'll show you his examples in a second, but there's a book called Understanding Comics. Yeah, Scott McCloud. Yeah, so here, let's see if we can take a look at it. Uh, so this is what I always, oh, I can't even look inside that. That's crazy. <laughs> Anyway, now anyway, the Scott McCloud. Now surely I can get at least one picture from the inside of this book. Yeah, here we go. Uh, so I use this a lot in my uh, 306 class. Uh, but what I like about it, it's it's a textbook about comics. But instead of just writing about comics in traditional writing, you know, in an essay format, he actually uses comics. So he, he sort of uses the medium of comics, this is a page from the actual book, to talk about comics. And it, to me that makes a lot of sense because there's things, you know, he talks about this in the book. He's like, look, here's something you can do in comics that, you know, you really can't do or can't do as well uh, just with the print. You know, if I was just writing about it or speaking about it, you know, th this particular concept would be hard to get across, like the zip lines or the, uh, these levels of abstraction. I always thought this was a really great idea, and they're just kind of, uh, you know, the question to me is, why don't we do something like this with rhetoric, um, or for game studies? You know, why are we writing about game studies uh, in a printed format? Uh, why not make a game uh, that sort of teaches you about games <laughs> in the way that, you know, McLeod did with that comics book? Uh, you know, I've even thought about doing something like that myself, uh, you know, you, you could learn Unity or Game Maker. Uh, there's even simpler tools than that. Uh, and as long as you, you know, had a pretty good concept in mind about, you know, here's, you know, I want to write a, a game that sort of teaches you about uh, different gameplay mechanics or something like that, or the, the role of, uh, you know, different kinds of, uh, uh, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, you know, maybe you wanted to have a, uh, kind of explore like statistics in role-playing games you know how some of them have strength and dexterity and intelligence and uh, other games have similar systems you know you could sort of make a game that will let you kind of tinker with those different settings and, and learn about uh, you know how they work in, in, a, in a game you know something like that could be could be fun now let's look at some of the examples he gives here composing new media cultivating landscapes of the mind let's see if we can find this and he does say this is one of the problems is, uh, you know, by the time they publish this, these things, the website could go down. And you might never be able to find <laughs> the project. <laughs> Cultivating landscapes of the mind. So we'll see if that's the case here. But it looks like it should be safe. Alan Cushman. You know, he talked about, like, the Adobe Flash, 
know, that's a good example of one that, you know, that just flat out doesn't work anymore um, unless you really are diligent about trying to, I can get, is anything popping up here? Let's <laughs> turn off the ad blocker. Yeah, but see, you know, here's, here's just a good example. You know, we're trying to look at this article that he's talking about, and it won't even pull up. You know, I have no idea what the problem is. But see, that's, uh, you know, probably with some code or some Adobe Flash or whatever they were using, and these uh, modern web browsers has, have decided that's no longer uh, secure. You know, I run into that sometimes with Unity. Uh, you, you can have a, a, an app. It works fine one day. <laughs> you know, you come back in a few years and you can't even load the game anymore because of the, you know, the standards. It's been updated and patched so many times it's no longer compatible. Let's see about this one. Susan de la Grange. You know, I'll make another tab here. So we can... Wunder. That's a fun word. Wunder. Kammer. Cornell. Okay. I remember when I was at uh, USF, University of South Florida, I got really interested in these. Uh, I wanted to do my PhD dissertation as a web text, and there was a, a lady that had come through the program before me who had done hers on Xena the Warrior Princess, which I thought was just totally awesome. <laughs> uh, but it was a, you know, one of these web texts, and I think she had done her own scripting and things. I don't know if we could even find that nowadays. It was kind of exciting at the time because that was the first, or at least one of the first digital PhD uh, dissertations in the world uh, that had been done right there. Let's see, can we actually get to this? <laughs> yeah, see, this one wants, wants flash, so God only knows if we'll be able to get this to work. We have retired flash, so... You're kind of seeing this in real time. The, the, the problem <laughs> that you might run into, you know, if you have a great idea uh, for some culminating project you want to do, you want to make a game, uh, you want to make a wiki, website, whatever, you know, you, you come back in a few years and it might not even be possible to run that thing on a modern computer anyway. And he does talk about that, the challenges of redesigning the well, let's see, that was something different there. Somewhere in here he talks about this problem. The importance. So, yeah, the final series of examples is the ones that I wanted to, to look at. And I'll, i got some other examples of his don't work. <laughs> yeah, jibjab.com. Do you remember this? I remember this. Let's see if this will even... Yeah, it looks like it's going to pull up. Jibjab. What was the one... He talks about this land, I think. Oh, poop, this thing's not found. So we can't even... Oh, there it is. Okay. So somebody, I guess, is archived Get this. Up. This was 2004? Good Lord. So I, I'll put a link there if you want to watch the video. But the reason this was, uh, you know, this caught so much attention from digital, digital rhetoricians was it's, first of all, it's pretty clearly political. So there's always, you know, polit uh, politics and rhetoric have always gone hand in hand. You know, nobody's going to question the role of rhetoric in politics. Uh, but it was also interesting in that it was one of the first really popular uh, mashups or, or parody, uh, whatever you want to call this pastiche, I've called it, I've seen it called several different things, but uh, you're sort of taking little clip art or uh, little clips, I guess, you're like snipping out his uh, head there, faces, and you kind of use a Photoshop or one of these video editing programs to sort of paste it in. Uh, and you could do this as a meme, just a static photo, or you can make animations like they did that, like a jib jab did here. And then they took that music. Uh, who's the one that did the... Uh, I should know that. Hang on. Good Lord, what a brain freeze. <laughs> brain fart. <laughs> yeah, Woody Guthrie. Uh, he's Minnesotan, isn't he? Or am I just making that up? American folk rock singer. 
Oklahoma. Well, for some reason, I was thinking he had something to do with Minnesota. Uh, maybe not. Uh, anyway, they took his song. Don't we have a Guthrie Theater? Hang on. Well, anyway, I appear to be dead wrong about that. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> you know more about Woody Guthrie. Uh, but anyway, this was uh, the idea to kind of mix up all these things, mash them up together. Don't worry too much about copyright infringement, trademark infringement, or whatever the case may be. Uh, and stick it out there as a form of parody, which the brilliant thing about that is that the Constitution specifically protects your right to make a parody. So even if it violates some copyrights and things, sometimes they can bring in that, uh, well, the Constitution says this is protected, so some stuff can slide under the, uh, you know, slide under that way. You think about all the songs, <clears throat> you know, Weird Al Yankovic, for example. <laughs> it's okay for him to uh, copy those songs, like uh, Michael Jackson songs, uh, and not have to worry about it. He still gets permission anyway, just because he's a nice guy. But, but technically, that's protected speech. But, you know, obviously digital rhetoricians, they love this, talking about all the rhetoric involved in there and how they're using the technology and, and not just the, the making it, uh, but also how they circulated it, you know, how it became a viral meme or they use the term rhetorical velocity. <laughs> you know, it sort of exploded and everybody seemed to like that video on, on both sides. You know, there's a little something in there. <laughs> I just remember <laughs> Uh, when I saw this thing, I just laughed. I about busted a gut on that thing. Uh, really hilarious. Uh, so that's, you know, people study these things and, you know, and write about them. Um, let's see. Virtual politic. Uh, persuasive games we've talked about. I think somebody said they even got the book based on my, my recommendation, which I think is a pretty smart move. I mean, Ian Bogost, I think, is one of the... Uh, his first, he's got a book called Unit Operations. It's basically unreadable. <laughs> Other than that, uh, all the rest of his stuff is very readable. You know, it's like TED Talk material. You, you read about, you read it, you get excited. You want to go off and, uh, you know, apply what he's talking about. I think the examples he used, I don't know if he's, they're going to talk about it in this chapter, but he's got a book called, or he talks about this America's Army game. Yeah, let's see what pulls up here. The official game of the U.S. Army, and I talk about this in my 280 class on video games as well, but this is basically a recruitment drive. You know, how do you get people to volunteer for the Army? Uh, they used to just use TV commercials, and they had, you know, I guess they probably still have the commercials and people coming into uh, school, you know, high schools trying to recruit people, to call them, <laughs> take them out to lunch, <laughs> breakfast, whatever. Uh, but they found that if you make a game and you sort of make joining the army part of the game and you learn, you know, there's actually some real life stuff in this game. So it's not just total fun. You know, you learn about the army's uh, policies and things in, in here. Uh, but they found that this, this game got <laughs> the recruitment drives. just went way up. I mean, this was the most successful thing they've ever done uh, to recruit uh, people into the army. So, Bogos was like, what, what What? was so great about that? You know, why did that work so well compared to some of those earlier drives like the you know, be all you can be and so on and so forth? And, and he coined that term procedural rhetoric. And he talked about how the, you know, there's something about sort of being involved. So you're not just reading, you're not just watching, you're not like passively consuming that game. Uh, you're actually in there, you're kind of making yourself part of it. And somehow that works. You know, I saw another example of that in some, uh, we had some workshops here about the Clary Act, basically talking about Title IX, uh, some uh, you know, sexual harassment policies, you know, and things that people <laughs> need to know. Uh, but again, instead of just um, presenting it as stuff, stuff to read, uh, they had like parts where you'd, you'd click a button and it would flip over and tell you part of the story. Uh, there were like role-playing exercises in there. There's some parts where you had to click and hold and drag and you know move one button to another spot, and that sounds kind of might sound a little bit trivial, uh, but according to uh, Bogost and this procedural rhetoric, you know it, it it might be kind of a subtle thing, but on the other hand, it's almost like you're kind of complicit in it now because you're, you know, you're, you're sort of involved in it. You're you're immersed in it in a way that you won't wouldn't be. Because you're like clicking that button and you're dragging it over there and 
<laughs> somehow uh, that works better than just reading about it or, or watching uh, somebody else do it. Uh, at least that's the theory. And he's got another example I just have to show you. It's one of my favorite examples of this kind of thing in action. Uh, let's see if I can get it. This might be another one that I'm unable to show you. Okay, yeah, it looks like this will work September 12th. Oh, dog on it. <laughs> uh, this could be the theme of the class. Uh, okay, anyway, I'll just tell you about it then. Uh, so with this game, you know, it starts up, doesn't tell you any context. And I'll give you one to play here in a minute. Uh, but it doesn't give you any context. It just has this, 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 this crosshairs you can move around. And you got these uh, little folks running around this village. And you click the, you don't know what to do. So you click the button and you see it drops a missile or a bomb and explodes parts of the of this town. And then if you look closer, you'll see there's little terrorists running around. They have guns, you know, and they, it's pretty clear who the, <laughs> the bad guys are. So you think, maybe I should try to click on those guys. Uh, but the way it's set up is you, you can never be accurate. So it's like every time you try to hit one, you end up accidentally killing an innocent person or blowing up a building. Uh, and then when you look a little closer, when that happens, the innocent people, uh, but they become terrorists. And now you, pretty soon, you got the whole screen nothing but, but terrorists running around. Uh, and the idea behind this is you're supposed to think, oh, I get it now. <laughs> I, I see what they're saying. You know, they're actually making this argument uh, about terrorism. You know, it's a rhetorical, political argument, but it's sort of couched in this game, and it's not spelled out for you. Uh, instead, you have to experience that for a while, and then eventually you'll get it. Uh, so there's another one of those. Let me just make sure that it works before I <laughs> assign it to you. And if you played this in one of my other classes, you don't have to play it again if you don't want to. But uh, let's see. Well, let's just take a chance. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it works okay. Windows and back. Uh, so go ahead and play this one. And uh, I hope I haven't assigned this already to you. But this is just another example that of a digital rhetorical artifact. And so play around with that for a while and think about how you might want to, uh, you know, you, you could study that and write about that. All right. And then he's got some other examples. Spam poetry. Uh, what else do we have there? Uh, propaganda remixes. More parody remixes. Uh, a person, a good person to read on this topic is Henry Jenkins. Uh, he's got several books. His big famous one is called Convergence Culture, and we have his, uh, a lecture from him coming up eventually. Oh, not lecture. <laughs> Convergence Culture. <laughs> uh, but he talks in this book. Show the doggone book. Okay, I can see the book here. Yeah. Uh, in this book, he talks about all this stuff, everything from fan fiction to Star Wars uh, videos that people make. Uh, to celebrate that. A lot of anime stuff is in here. A lot of Harry Potter stuff. Uh, but it's people remixing. And Larry Lessing is another good source on this. These concepts. You know, I'm kind of curious about... I don't think enough has really been done with bots yet. You know, All these rhetorical bots that are out there trying to spread uh, maybe good, but maybe also bad information. And they're so good now they can actually imitate humans. You know, so you think you're chatting with somebody, but it's really these, these bots trying to persuade you to do something. Uh, that, to me, is it seemed like pretty fertile ground for a digital rhetorician to be looking into, like, how do you code those things? Or how do you make those things? How do you study them? How do you recognize them? And you know, that seemed like that would be a pretty good topic. Uh, yeah, this is kind of strange. Rhetoric in the code. Uh, so if you have access to source code, of course, it's not going to work on, on that page. But if we uh, view the source, you know, view page source, you can always get the source code for these web pages. And if it's a open source product, what that means is that you can uh, view the script or view the code uh, that they use to make that piece of software. And within that code, you can make comments um, with C sharp. It's just you type two slashes, and then you can make a, a little comment there. And it won't be compiled as part of the program. It's just ignored by the compiler or the computer. Uh, but if you give that script to somebody, uh, then they can see the code. And usually it's for things like this section is supposed to 
you know, regulate weapons. <laughs> or this section is for the combat mechanics, you know, most stuff like that. Uh, but you can also just have fun with it and make little funny comments in there. And, and sometimes uh, it's jokes and sarcasm. Uh, but this guy actually used it for political purposes, which I thought was kind of interesting. So I guess he had a web comic, and then if you looked at the source code, there was this line about, Hello, person who cares enough to read source code. Please donate $8.88. And any amount with the 88 cents at the end is flagged for me to let me know that it came from someone who I guess is a lot like me. <laughs> so it was almost kind of an Easter egg uh, that he had. Who is this guy? Tevis? What's Tevis's first name? Tevis, Tevis. Uh, Sean Tevis had put that in there. That's pretty clever. You know, and of course, people found it, and they probably thought this, this is a whole lot of fun, you know, that they, they he would put that in there. Uh, then just to wrap up, we, you know, he gives a couple other examples, calls for case studies. You know, basically what, if you want to pursue digital rhetoric, if you want to do, if you're a graduate student looking for a project, or maybe you're thinking about something for this class, you're like, what am I going to write about for that paper, you know? What, what am I going to do? Well, I'm an to give you a lot of ideas. Look at this uh, Sweetland Digital Rhetoric Collaborative. And you can see this type of stuff here that they're calling for. Uh, collaboration page, book series. There's a wiki. <laughs> collaborative. Yeah, it looks like their collaborative project's going about as well as some of the ones. <laughs> uh, never mind. Uh, you know, another one I would recommend is the UPenn. And I've always, I'm always talking about this, but uh, this is basically a clearinghouse for papers, journals, conferences. And even if you don't want to present at a conference or write a paper, sometimes you just don't know what to write about. You're like, I don't know. I mean, I know the topic that I need, but I don't know where to get started. Uh, this is a really good resource, and we could type in like digital rhetoric. And you can see these conferences that are coming up. And then you can click on these and get some ideas about what they're talking about. This one doesn't look too detailed. Let's click another one. Call for Papers, Literature in the Digital Age. And topics include reading theories, cognitive approaches, literacy, and the archival the carbon footprint of literacy. So again, not <laughs> maybe this will be the jackpot. Crisis of truth: the digital era and the future of knowledge. Theme of the symposium: Does the digital, the emergence of digital space as a new culture of knowledge generation and dissemination, prompts cultural introspection on the new possibilities of <laughs> blah 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 blah? Does the digital also alter the very character of such knowledge? For instance, its truth conditions. Let's move on down. Issues that might be discussed include, but are not limited to. So here we go. So here's what I'm talking about. Like you don't know what to write about. You come to a page like this and you can see, well, we know that people are interested in digital space and the culture of knowledge communication. How and in what ways has the culture of reading and publishing experienced a transition in the last decade, especially with digitalization? How and in what ways has the culture of reading and publishing is that just a <laughs> repeat? <laughs> and the implication of on, oh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. What implications does online publication have for the digital commons and democratic access to knowledge? <clears throat> you know, so maybe this is not the, you know, you can read all these and see which one you like the best. Uh, the digital and dissent. How does digital space incorporate dissent as a democratizing force? And we've got some conceptions of Satchmagraha, truth force, or speaking truth to power, take shape in the digital era. So some of this stuff, I'm not even really sure what, what they're talking about. But the nice thing about looking at these things, and he gives some more examples here, is again, you, you, can, uh, you can say, look, I know people are interested in this topic because here's a call for papers. You know, they, they say they want people <laughs> that are talking about this area. <laughs> So you don't really have to worry about that, you know, the so what question. Why, why do you want to write about this? Who's going to care? Well, people care. Look, there, there it is, uh, CFP. <laughs> They're asking for this work. Uh, so I like, like it for that purpose. 
And I always say, you know, if you're going to write a paper anyway, you know, it might as well be something that you can present on at a conference or maybe even submit it to a journal. You know, you know, why not? So I think that'll probably do it here for us. You know, we talked about a lot of this stuff. You know, he says, not to mention new forms, mobile applications, augmented reality systems, digital games. Uh, so if you are interested in digital rhetoric, I hope you enjoyed this book. I know it's a little bit technical at some spots, but hopefully not too bad. And hopefully these lectures also cleared it up somewhat for you. And, you know, do click on some of the links that he puts in here. Maybe some of them actually work. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's like nothing works in there. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm going to stop it here. As always, if you've got comments, questions, love to read those. Keep them coming. And I will see you next time.